writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, crime drama, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. And with me today is... Co-host Kathleen Kayembe, paranormal romance author under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and going to protect her voice today. Going to protect your voice? Project. Oh, project I thought she said voice. protect too. I'm like, huh? I was protecting it by speaking softly. Ah, okay. yeah. uh, my name is Jennifer Stolzer, and I'm a children's book author and illustrator. Uh, Brad R. Cook. I write historical fantasy like Iron Horseman, and Iron Zulu is coming out soon, so go ahead and pre-order it. <laughs> Fedora Avis. I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and soon to come out in early at 16. Will be Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West, and I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. I'm Melanie Claney, um, author of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. Okay, today we're going to continue with part two of Stephen King's On Writing and condensed into 22 lessons. But before we do, I need to retract something I said last week. Hmm. Uh, retraction. A retraction. Yes. No, actually, actually uh, it's something. I don't know what he said. This entire. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. You were here, but yeah. Okay. Uh, I said a lot of things. Over the last week, actually, over the last several weeks, I've been pretty much on call with work with my bill pay job. And last week we talked about um, Stephen King said basically unplug yourself in order to be creative. I'm just paraphrasing it. And I had said, no, I need to, I don't want to be unplugged. I go to coffee houses to write and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And, I, and I'm not really changing that aspect. But this bloody cell phone with work, con with, with my bill pay job, texting and calling on a constant basis, you've got to sit there ready to pick up and be ready at a given moment 24-7. Yeah, it's harder than hell to write and focus on what you're writing when you've got a situation like that. So, in that case, I will retract that aspect. Mm -hmm. But, and on that note, it's just something I really noticed over this little last week. Yeah, you think it's more like yeah. an addendum. Yeah. Okay, I'll go be addendum. <laughs> so, number 20, I'm uh, sorry, number 12. <laughs> All right, well. There were 21 backwards. Just yeah, to refresh, we are on the 22 lessons from Stephen King on how to be a great writer by Maggie Zhang. All right, we're on number 12. So, Go listen to the last 11. <laughs> um, tell stories about what people actually do. And on this, Stephen says, Bad writing is more than a matter of shit syntax and faulty observation. Bad writing usually arises from a stubborn refusal to tell stories about what people actually do. To face the fact, uh, let us say, that murderers sometimes help old ladies cross the street. I think that's part of any good characterization, mm -hmm. that it should be complex. Certainly you can't make all of your minor characters complex. No. You can give them a line or two, you can make them a stereotype, but the characters that you want to focus on have to be complex. They have good sides, they have bad guys sides, and, and an interesting villain is just as important as an interesting hero. Most well, certainly. Oh, I was going to say that the... Um, this Rule 12 was written about characterization, making sure you make your characters multidimensional. So I think Fedora is spot on with that. If you want an interesting hero, your villain has to be interesting, because otherwise the hero's not doing a whole, whole lot, unless it's a fairy tale or that sort of story. Even if it is a fairy tale, they can be interesting, too. I mean, a big bad mm -hmm. wolf can be interesting. Yes. Oh, yes, but, like, in a in a novel is where I'm thinking, like, you definitely need to have multi-dimensional characters, no matter whether they're the hero or the villain. Since not everybody reads all the same books, I'm going to actually throw out a perfect example of what we're talking about in a movie form. Hmm. Quentin Tarantino, Pulp Fiction. I don't remember characters' names, but I do remember actors. 
John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson. Mm-hmm. They're assassins. And they're going to go commit, a, commit an assassination. Mm-hmm. So what do they do as they're driving? They, they, they have, have small talk. They <laughs> have small talk. And they have a conversation. Not about, hey, yeah, I prefer the um, 45 Desert Eagle to when I commit my homicides. Or, you, know, <laughs> you don't do that. that if, if I remember right, I could have a subject wrong, but it's basically as, as quiz as small talk as this. I think they were talking about hamburgers. What made a good hamburger? Yes, most famously the ones. Yeah. The Royale cheese. The Royale cheese, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they call them Big Mac in France. Mm. It's Royale cheese. So that's that. Brad, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that, yes, you have to do that, especially with your villains. Most importantly with your villains. But I agree also with what Kathleen said, that you have to have your, you have to have a good villain for your hero uh, in order to kind of have that nice balance. I don't know. I, I, I hope, I should say, that's what we all strive for when we're creating the major characters in our novel. Uh, and, you know, throw a couple of attributes at your minor characters, too. Yeah. I was going to say, that's what makes Batman's rogues gallery so fascinating oh, and yes. what makes Batman so fascinating. Like, if you're comparing him to Superman, Superman's got all these powers, but Batman has his mind in a human body. So what stops Superman is a rock, but Batman, all of these mental issues, it's like a series of mental illnesses embodied by like characters who you're fascinated by, even as they're doing villainous things. The Joker is amazing amazing and he's a villain and he's bats like not just pun i was trying to keep my language but um he's bats and you (laughs) love watching him and you're fascinated by what he does to the extent that you can be worried about batman because this guy's insane (laughs) he's got to fight an insane person and no matter how good a detective you are if you can't predict what the other person's gonna do you're in trouble so yeah you need good villains excellent villains well, we use the the word strong so much. We write a strong character, a strong female character, a strong male character. This is the definition of a strong character. Mm-hmm. It's not about physical strength or mental acuity or the ability to kick a guy in the balls. It's about uh, writing a character that has strength of character. That they have good sides and bad sides. Your hero isn't uh, a bland, uh, altruistic, nothing good guy that you know is going to make the good decision every single time. Your hero has a dark side that's not just he cares too much. Or uh, he had that one he he used to have those bad associations and now he has to deal with his bad friends. Like this, maybe this is a person that has, still has feelings of being uh, being under attack or has to struggle with the fact that he's not always right all the time. He's made mistakes. These are like hero aspects, but they have negative facets to them, and that makes them feel stronger. Yeah, the most recent Superman movie was it Man of Steel or mm, sure? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, well, yes. what bugged me the most good. about that movie was General Zod. They had the opportunity to make such a great villain out of him, and they completely blew it. Mm-hmm. What well, they do? Because I haven't seen it. They made him completely two-dimensional. He was the bad guy from the very beginning to the very end. He came to Earth and said, turn over Superman or I'll destroy your whole planet. No, he did not come in and try and be Superman's friend and say, I'm here to save our people from extinction. I'm here to save us. I was your father's best friend. Together we can do it. Mm-hmm. And then Superman could feel betrayed when he finds out that Zod plans to destroy the Earth to recreate Krypton. No! Zod came in as the bad guy from the first instant. Wasn't Superman the bad guy in that movie, too? Apparently? Not exactly, like, no. I heard that the character. You're thinking about the was... next... Oh, he, he killed somebody at the end and everyone's upset about that. He also leveled all of Metropolis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but if you look at the movie... It wasn't exactly his fault. He wasn't a very experienced superhero, and it was all collateral damage that he couldn't... He couldn't figure out a way to get Zod away from the city for the big fight. Okay, I was just... Because I had heard some reviews that part of the problem people had with that film was that Superman was not heroic. They... Superman wasn't super competent. That's a difference. He was somewhat incompetent. That's different. And you want to have heroes (laughs) that are at least competent in some things. No, no, he was young and still no, no, learning. I, mean, about I get heroes that. in general. You want them to be competent in some things. And if there's a learning curve, like there was in Invincible, 
with Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson, you want to see that at least he was good at something once, and there's, <laughs> there's hope for him to become the hero you want yeah. him to be. Yeah, see, okay. I don't have any objections to what they did with with young Clark Kent, Kal-El, per se. It's <laughs> Zod that it really bugs me. Yeah, but movie. old Zod was a bad guy from Star Trek. I'm not too. saying that he shouldn't have been a bad guy. I'm saying how they were Superman characterized. Too, yeah, old Zod ruled, so just yeah. had to throw that out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I want to take an example from a classic, Please. which illustrates something about layered characters. It is that your perception as a reader is best if it actually changes during the course of the novel and may entirely flip. Take Great Expectations, for example. When Pip's benefactor is not the person he thought it was at all, it, in fact, is a convict that he had helped early in the story and totally forgotten about. And that is a flip. Mm. And then we have also Miss Havisham, mm. who seems like a relic of some description, who is mean to men of all kinds, and especially Pip. Mm -hmm. Well, he doesn't even know it. <laughs> and to Estella. But she has a very layered backstory, which makes her, if not very likable, at least understandable. So the characters need layers and to have progression with them as the story goes along. I was going to bring up, because you mentioned that flip, a uh, novel card Arslan, A-R-S-L-A-N by M.J. Ng. I have not finished reading it because the beginning uh, had a rape, so there's trigger warnings there. It's about a dictator who takes over basically the world and sets up shop in small town Illinois. And it's about the people who are around this dictator who are basically like stuck with him, stuck under his domination, but who come to to feel for and like him. And despite what happens at the beginning, he, he rapes people, at a, like children, for an audience to do a physical display of power. And over the course of the book, you start to like this guy. And that's really hard. I would think. Like, you start to root for him, but, you know, that's a serious flip. And that's what good writing can do. You want mm. to be able to do that because he's not all bad. He's not all bad. He's the hero of his own story. And yeah, everyone's you know, the hero of their own story. You need, yeah, you need to think about that when you're writing characters. Like, nobody sets out to be evil unless they are the Joker, and he's insane. So well, he I doesn't mean, even think he's doing. And he, yeah, you know, he's doing everything on purpose, though. Yeah, yeah. So what? Are you okay? I'm not trying to give. Yeah. I'm trying to pick Brad brain from across the table. And you're making this, it's like charades suddenly. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I was going like to say, flying across the table. Puppets. Puppets. I was going to say, another Three example. Words. Sounds like. Another, well, no, another <laughs> example, stop, stop. but also to do, writing about what people actually really do do, not, yeah, and then when you go, know what they really do do, I'm going to borrow from Stephen King. I said in the first episode mm. of this, I'm not a super fan of Stephen King, but when he talks, I shut up and listen. <laughs> and, uh, one of the books which I really did love and it was made into a movie and now I'm blanking on it which is why I was trying to do charades I was thinking Brad probably would know it but describe it it'll probably right, right, well that's where I'm going <laughs> we're here to help Relax. you <laughs> chills um, it is where a I think the character was a high school kid discovers that his neighbor or someone on the street anyway out people um what Apt pupil? Yes, apt pupil. Where the person is a yeah, war is a yeah. war criminal from from Nazi Germany. It's made into a movie with Vincent Kartheiser and uh, mm -hmm. Ian McKellen. Sir mm -hmm. Ian McKellen. Thank mm -hmm. you. I just couldn't think of a name, mm -hmm. but that's a perfect example. I mean, you can't, you should not like either of these two characters, but you really should not like the Nazi. But yeah. <laughs> He's such a he is a very strong character, and really King demonstrates a good example of writing people doing what people really actually do. That's a great example of it. Yes, I'd like to make a plug for our next episode before suggesting we get on to point thirteen. <coughs> um, in a future episode, um, within the next few weeks, we're going to be doing a discussion on what did we call it. Uh, why do people never go to the bathroom in fiction or the practical protagonist? Mm -hmm. And basically, we're going to talk about why people don't do regular, normal people things like have day jobs or have family. 
things like that in fiction, because you want to have what people actually do in your fiction, but we're going to talk about why some of those things are not necessarily good for a protagonist. So, we will continue this discussion Yeah, later. it'll unfold yeah. more later. Indeed. Number 13. All right. Take risks, don't play it safe. I'm convi- And this is what Stephen has to say on this. I'm convinced that fear is at the root of most bad writing. Uh, writers should throw back their shoulders, stick out their chins, and put their writing in charge. Uh, try any goddamn thing you like, no matter how boring, normal, or outrageous. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, toss it. You never know until you try. Exactly. I'm mm-hmm. a huge fan of taking risks. Yeah. If, 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 how, how else... How can you expand yourself as an artist? You can if always edit back, but it's hard to push forward. Right. Practice. If you're not pushed, if you're not dancing on the outside of a box. I'm wondering if this particular rule has anything to do with the fear of being boring, writing boring things. I think it's the fear of writing of not, mundane things. I mostly live in fear of not being able to sell the thing I'm writing. Hmm. I have that fear, and yep. I have a f- that, that's one huge one. Second fear, I go with that, and this goes back. We talked. This is what I get for listening to our episodes more, more than once, because mm-hmm. I'm the editor slash um, producer of it. There's one where I talked about where I was working on a female private eye, and I had trouble writing it. I said I put it aside and couldn't do anything for it, any further. One of my big fears was I wasn't making her female. Hmm. I, I was making a man in a skirt, and I don't think I really was, but that was the fear I had, and it kind of stopped it. <laughs> So, yes, and passive writing, I think, goes to that, is some passive... No, there's no such thing as good passive writing. <laughs> uh, let me let me stop yeah. myself there. But there are... If you ever write with Microsoft Word, it will try to change things back to some language that's more businessy. In which, I hate to say, in business writing, there is more passive. But in fiction, you don't want passive, and you, that's a good example of seeing where... The differences apply. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> you know, of course, there are dangers in writing anything that's too outre, too far out there, because you're going to get pilloried. Uh, take a look at William Burroughs, for example, <laughs> who wrote Queer <laughs> and Junkie at a time in the 1930s when no one even recognized that such things existed, yeah, exactly. much less wrote books about them. And he was royally Hillary, but then he was royally pilloried for everything else, too. <laughs> See, this is why you use non diplomas <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring up the fearlessness that was mentioned earlier about, you know, um, write for yourself, don't write for an audience. And I think this particular rule especially applies in rough drafts. Because there is a point when you should start thinking about your audience and a point where you start editing out, as Brad said. But for your rough draft, for your first draft, you should just throw everything in there and don't worry about whether it's going to stay. Because that's the draft where you are going to, you know, well, hopefully you will take all the risks that you need to for this story. You can rein in everything later. But this draft, this first draft is for you. So don't let the internalized voices of other people stop you from, you know, doing what you need to for the story for the first draft especially. And I think it's always possible to rewrite for a specific audience. Mm-hmm. That is, if you want to write for a young adult audience, you have to be careful mm-hmm. of what you're writing. You really do. And phrase it in certain ways that will not be terribly offensive to the adults who are going to buy these darn books. <laughs> but that's so, what rewrites are for. <laughs> so there is a time to rewrite and change things that would be terribly offensive. Uh, I would say that he would even agree with that in a little bit, even though he didn't do much. Yeah, we were both looking at Brad. Like, didn't, wasn't something going on with one of your stories where you had to write it for a different audience than you had originally written it for? Uh, yeah, actually, Iron Horseman got yeah. changed, but was well, got suggested to become a middle grade. Mm-hmm. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, it is a YA. Uh, it stars a 16-year-old, but they felt if we could de-age him down to like 13, it might have more appeal. So we tried it for a while, and it, it did not work, because it's a coming-of-age tale. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's hard to shoehorn that down, and but uh, it works much better as a YA. But yeah, it totally, and you know, I turned it back. It was no mm-hmm. real big deal, but it was a interesting couple of months trying to change it around. 
But you can change things around like that. Like, oh, most so definitely there's always, you can. There's always an opportunity later to, to do the revisions, but first draft especially, take risks, don't play it safe, be fearless. Yeah, and I later wrote a, you know, a couple middle grades, and they're much, much better. <laughs> <laughs> number 14, and I am almost dancing in my chair Okay. For number 14. Realize that you don't need drugs to be a good writer. <laughs> Yay. The idea that the creative endeavor and mind-altering substances are entwined is one of the great pop intellectual myths of our time. Any claim that drugs are, and alcohol are necessary to dull a finer sensibility are just the usual self-serving bullshit. Hmm. We should probably put like a PG-13 rating on this one. Guess like, what? Every, it, it, so it, far, all, of, all, of our, all of our episodes are technically Let's PG-13. Let's remember that it's Stephen King. Yes. It is Stephen King. But what makes me want to dance in my seat, let's see with this, is that Stephen King had, had an addiction, huge addiction, mm-hmm. and that he fought to get off of it and has been able to continue writing. I know, I, in reading either his books or on writing or interview, he was very, very much afraid mm-hmm. that once he got off the drugs, he wouldn't be able to continue writing. Well, it's just to go, just to show you how uh, how good a writer he naturally is. You know, he's still writing even on the other side of his addiction. But when he was going through withdrawals, he actually wrote Cujo. He has no memory of writing that right. book. Right, right. <laughs> he doesn't remember that book at all because that was the worst part. But it, Cujo is about being attacked by his addiction. Mm-hmm. I think misery was also part of that. Oh yeah. When he, as he's getting off the drugs. Mm-hmm. I think, the later version. Yeah. King and Julia Cameron, who wrote *The Artist's Way* and is a big teacher of creativity and unleashing your own natural creative you know, identity, um, they both struggled with alcoholism and got sober. And it sounds like they both also had the the fear: if I stop drinking will I stop being creative? Because alcoholism is going to kill me, but if I can't be creative, I feel like I'm going to die. And they both, through cutting that out of their lives, discovered, no, they really are extremely creative people. And while it may have seemed like it was helping at first to lower the inhibitions of their internal critics and get going, get started writing, and that is hard, but it stopped helping and became a hindrance to their lives and to their creativity. So... I think it's important to recognize that I think everybody's creative and it's good to find ways that are healthy to unleash that kind of expression in yourself because drugs, things are addictive, alcohol, they'll, they'll be a nice crutch for a little while, but only for a little while. They're not actually going to help the long-term problem, which is learning to let yourself be creative. So yeah, the end. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, P.S. Don't kill yourself to be creative. You don't need to. The creativity is in your soul. Mm-hmm. Some people need a little, you know, lubrication to get it to to slide out more carefully. Well, actually, some people. <laughs> but think after they a while, do. you'll. It's like all you just all the alcohol is really doing is taking away your fears. So yes. Just learn not to be afraid. You don't need to turn to drugs. And learn not to be afraid sounds really mm-hmm. big headed of me. But uh, face your fear. Don't. Don't turn to the crutch. A good way of doing a similar thing, but in a healthy way, is creating a habit. Mm. If you create a a writing habit, in our case, a writing habit where you're sitting down at your desk same time every day as much as you can, um, or you have a routine where you get into your writing mood and then you're in the writing mood, the more often you do that, the more you're training your brain, this is creative time, this is writing time, let loose. So that kind of thing helps, I think, just as much. It doesn't happen as quickly, but forming a habit like that will help much longer term. I think something else is at work here, too, and that is image. There are, in the mystery world, tons of, dozens of hard-drinking men who Mm -hmm. wrote mysteries a la... Uh, anybody you care to name, Dashiell Hammett, for example, and Mickey Spillane. Well, I'm not so sure they really drank as much as they tried to make us think they did, mm-hmm. because it was part of that 
that tough guy persona they were trying to put across and not some wimpy writer kind of person that wears white shorts, you know? I think it's partly image. I think on that note, the image note, be who you are as a writer. You, everybody is completely different. Everybody. Like, right now I'm wearing dice earrings, black pants, and a nice blue shirt. I look a little weird. Jennifer's wearing a t-shirt and capris. Fedora's wearing all black. Like, oh, no, we didn't mention Jen's, what's on Jen's t-shirt. Star Wars. Star Wars yeah, t-shirt. It actually Jen. says, I'm chilling with my, my home droids. droids. Yeah, oh, my goodness. 3PO and R2-D2. <laughs> like, and Melanie's wearing an Archon shirt. Brad's wearing a button-up. <laughs> David's wearing a red t-shirt that does not have the Cardinals logo on it, even though this is St. Louis. What is uh, this? Wait a minute. <laughs> like, oh, it's on the back. Yeah, oh, it's a. Uh, it has many words. It is a quote t shirt with samurai. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So like, it's more the most definitive of all of ours. <laughs> <laughs> which of us Which of us is the real writer? All of us. We are all completely different in how we present ourselves. And that's okay. So just be the person you are and don't worry about looking like a writer or looking like an artist. That's wasting your time and energy. Just look how you want. The end. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to throw out Hemingway anyway, who said, mm-hmm. write drunk and edit sober. <laughs> you should throw him out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go to number 15. Mm-hmm. Don't try to steal someone else's voice, the cardinal sin. Uh, as King says, you can't aim a book like a cruise missile. And as Zhang says, when you try to teach, or when you try to mimic another writer's style for any reason other than practice, you'll produce nothing but a pale imitation. Uh, This is because you can never try to replicate the way someone feels and experiences truth, especially not through a surface-level glance at vocabulary and plot. No two people talk with likely anyway. Well, I agree with that. Two issues. One, especially when I was younger, I found myself doing that accidentally, and that's something to keep in mind. And number two, uh, I seem to remember several series of books that are quite long that technically all have the same author in quotes, but certainly don't have the same author in fact. Uh, Nancy Drew, Scarily Trixie King. Belden. Um, Boxcar Children. Boxcar uh, Children. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but even within these, some of the times, uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on which Nancy Drews, but you can figure out which, you know, which oh, yeah. is written by mm-hmm. which author. But even as a little kid, I understood when the Boxcar Children changed. There you go. Yeah. So like, even well, James Bond has its changes from yeah. author to author. This this is about trying to steal someone else's voice. Right. I think those are intentionally trying to write like the voice that originally was the author. Um, for example, there's... I got it. I'm sorry. There's a book series, the Peter Sir Peter Wimsey Mysteries, that were written by Dorothy Sayers. And another writer came after Sayers died and picked up her notes and is, you know, continuing the series. And she's trying to write like Sayers... And everyone's aware that she's not. But that's, I think, an issue of, uh, what do you call it? Money. <laughs> <laughs> well, same for these other books, though, with Carolyn Keene and Nancy Drew. They were all about money. Mm-hmm. Well, those exactly. Are, those Wheel are of not... Time, finish, finishing the series because the author died. But the thing is, that's a consistency issue. Yeah. People are going to be aware that this is not all the same writer, but they're trying to be consistent. And of course, these people might easily fail. We don't know yet whether the new Stig Larson guy, whoever he is, <laughs> and the new book is going to yes. yeah. sail. And if you're writing a TV series, those have multiple writers for a series that's a continuing arc. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that's the issue here, because those are cases where you need to try and write consistently like other people. I think this rule is more about stealing trying to steal someone else's voice instead of using your own. Because you're never going to perfectly steal anyone's voice, and unless you're practicing, um, which it mentions specifically for other than practice, which is a good reason to try and, like, imitate, don't do it, because you will never succeed. You can never be somebody else better than you can be yourself, or better than they can be themselves. So, Nicely put. So, yeah, it's good to try writing like Hemingway. We do exercises like that in class sometimes. It helps you learn economy, but... You know, when it's time for you to write your own story, don't try to write it like Hemingway would. Write it the way the story is telling you it needs to be written. Yes, as in no one can write Shakespeare but Shakespeare. But yes, and I totally agree with that. Um, Actually, uh, to copy is nice, 
but uh, to find your own voice, that thing within you that sets you apart from everybody else, and when you read it, when somebody reads it, they know who they're reading. I mean, that's one what we're all searching for. That's priceless. Yeah, that's that's what we're all. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the holy grail that we're all you know on a quest to find. So, yes, search I, your voice. I do think that Melanie brought up a good point, though. I know sometimes when I read a lot of an author, because I'll just like, I'll mainline an author for a while. Um, when I read a lot of an author, some of my writing initially will sound kind of like them because that's the voice that's been in my head for so long and is so familiar. Mm-hmm. But if you write enough, you'll get out of that. Like, you just write your way out of that person's, you know, voice. It, it happens. Mm-hmm. If you read a lot of Hemingway, you'll start writing kind of like Hemingway for a while. Just read something else that does not sound like him. It'll wash it out of your system. Mm-hmm. It's part of learning. So it's writer detox. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Number 16. All right. Understand that writing is a form of telepathy. Uh, All the arts depend upon telepathy to some degree, but I believe that writing is the purest distillation, says King. Um, Words are just the medium through which the transfer happens. Uh, Use the time of a total stranger in such a way that... Oh, sorry, he's quoting uh, Vonnegut now. Use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel that time was wasted. Can you read the part about um, writing being transference? After distillation, says King. Yeah, well, that's Zhang. So that's yeah. what well, I was reading King. Oh. Uh, so this is Zhang, who says, An important element of writing is transference. Your job isn't to write words on the page, but rather to transfer the ideas inside your head into the heads of your readers. One of the things I've always said is that <clears throat> I wish I could be a painter like Jen is able to illustrate and so forth. Hmm. But really, as a writer, what I'm doing is th- I am painting. I'm, my, I might describe something and you might see it just slightly differently, but my job is to paint the picture, to paint the thought, if you will, onto the white canvas, blank canvas is inside my reader's head. Well, I have to completely agree here because... Uh This is the only way that I am taking thoughts directly out of my head and putting them directly into the reader's head. Um, So I can understand why King says this is the purest form of telepathy. Um, And I get that, because that's what we're all doing. I mean, it's the reason why we go through and edit and reread scenes and reread and to make certain that everything we're trying to impart gets across. That's why we hand it over to beta readers and critiquers and editors and all this other kind of stuff, so that by the time the reader gets it, it has been honed to a point where it is that beautiful brush stroke that just, you know, pulls the reader along. And I think it's not just ideas. No. The best writing, as the best art of any kind, whether music or painting or whatever, is also about transferring feelings, mm-hmm. getting people to feel something, to internalize it to the point that it's at least as much their story as it ever was yours. Yep, to an elicit an emotion, uh. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, he said telepathy, not empathy. Um, An empath will transfer feelings, emotions. A telepath transfers words, thoughts. And your aim is to transfer your words, which you wrote, which the reader is hearing or, like, having go through their head, and have those be powerful enough that they evoke emotion. And that's, that's what you want. Like, you can't give the reader the emotions, but you, you give the reader the words in the right order, in the right way, they will have those emotions themselves. That will well up in them naturally. And that's pretty cool. Can we twist this up so that basically books are telepathic cruise missiles? <laughs> I like that idea. I thought he said they were. <laughs> as, as, they as, as no, I know, but, you know. He as, said you can't aim it like a cruise missile. But as long as we don't have Psychor or Psychops, <laughs> we're good. I just like the idea of a telepathic cruise missile. Trust only the core. Trust only the core. Okay, sorry, Babylon 5 reference. and That's that's like the subtitle of the show now. Well, and also (laughs) in a way, Alfred Bester, the author, reference. Hmm. Something else that's pretty cool about this telepathy business (laughs) is when you're reading poetry, if you read it aloud, you start breathing the way the poet wanted you to breathe. Mm -hmm. And that's really cool, too. So, yeah, it is kind of like telepathy or, you know, sharing thoughts, sharing brainwaves. 
I still love the way that commas, periods, you know, different punctuation like that controls a reader. You know, you make them pause a moment, you make them stop. You know, you, you kind of control the way that you're feeding them the information. It's a fun thing. The pacing. And if you ever want a really good demonstration of this, if you don't, if you are a naysayer and you think, oh, bad punctuation is not that important, whatever. And H believe it or not. Leaves. No, <laughs> no. I, I, though that's a great one, too. But no, I, I, there's a beautiful meme out there that is the Oxford comma, the walk-in comma, and the Shatner comma. <laughs> <laughs> Even it is hilarious. Re if you can find it, read it within that brief amount of time, you'll be convinced. I As thought you were. Be. I thought you were going to say the one about Hitler and Stalin being hookers. No, because <laughs> that's about the Oxford comma. Okay, I'll just find that one. Hitler, Stalin, and some hookers, or something like that. Okay. Go into a bar, and it's got pictures. It's beautiful. They're wearing pasties in the one without the Oxford comma. Because it makes sense. It's, well, uh, it's Hitler, Stalin, some hookers, and a horse walk into a bar. So it's Hitler, Stalin, and it's Hitler, Stalin, some hookers. You know, Hitler and Stalin, some hookers. Mm -hmm. You know, that turns into one statement, and then it turns them into hookers. Yeah, comments are important, man. Found the images. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that one, but okay. Let me explain let's, yeah. Let's get back yeah. back on topic here. Go. Seventeen. Seventeen. Yes, sir. All right. Seventeen. Take Both your good. writing seriously. You can reproach the, right, the act of writing with nervousness, excitement, hopefulness, or despair, says King. Come to it any way but lightly. If you don't want to take your writing seriously, uh, he suggests that you close the book and do something else. Um, and then Zhang quotes uh, Susan Sontag. Uh, the story must strike a nerve in me. Uh, my heart should start pounding when I hear the first line in my head. I start trembling at the risk. I don't think I want to tremble. <laughs> Not at five o'clock in the morning. But I do want to be inspired. I want to I want to want to go to my computer. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, that's my idea of inspiration. I just want to go there and see what happens. I need a certain amount of playfulness in my writing. So he says come to it anyway but lightly and I think like that was like, oh no. If I take writing too seriously, I lose it. Like my brain shuts up on itself. But I think what he means is to make your writing important. You don't have to come at it like all oh, serious. This is serious business. I have to write serious stuff. Serious, serious. But you have to see your writing as important and as something that you protect and make time for. I'm guessing that's what he means in this part. Because, you know, we all write differently. We all have different ways we do things. For me, I need to not take things seriously for the first draft so I can be fearless and write what needs to be written. But yeah, protecting your writing is, I think, what this is, rule, what this rule is about. Yeah, yeah, I would agree more with the protecting your writing, because to be honest, I don't think it's about necessarily being, writing about serious topics or writing about anything like that. You could write a, you know, humor, but you have to be serious about your craft. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be, you know, you have to write in a, in a serious manner in the sense of you're going to pay attention to your punctuation. You're going to write with, you know the idea of putting this out and publishing it and putting it before people who are going to read it and then understanding that you do have a voice no matter what and that voice is important um, so it doesn't matter if you've never published anything before it doesn't matter if you've published everything before um, you know if you've, you've done it all you know you have to understand that on some level you have to believe in yourself as an author beyond anything else because to be honest there is no one going to tap you on the shoulder and go hey you're an author now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Go ahead. I'll go no. after you. I think it's kind of a matter of respecting what it is. Yes. Well, I think it's also, too, I, there's nothing I'm going to disagree with, with between what was said. I'm going to add, just add to it. I think also, too, it is the way the way you respect, and I won't come to that as treat, the way you respect the art of writing. A lot of us are part of of writer communities that are sitting around this table. A lot of us are officers in various um, guilds, chapters, whatever you want to call it, of writers inside the writing community. How many of us have seen where people play the, the role of a writer they never really write? Hmm. 
I'm getting lots of nods, yes. lots of hmms, you know. I think everybody wants to be able be to say they're a writer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even without writing. Exactly. <laughs> Someone has that book in them, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. there is that kind of natural call. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Most definitely are there people who, I think, very much have a desire to write, but they don't have the commitment to actually... Uh, you know, sit down every day and write. And they're mm-hmm. afraid to show it to anyone yeah. else. Oh, yeah. They so write for themselves. Fear can be a big part of it. Yeah. It's amazing what fear will stop. Okay, next one. Fear is the mind killer. It will pass anyway. through me. All right, and as I just said, actually, mm-hmm. number 18, write every single day. Uh, as King says, once I start to work on a project, I don't stop and I don't slow down unless I absolutely have to. If I don't write every day, the characters begin to stale off in my mind. I begin to lose my hold on the story's plot and pace. Uh, and then Jang comes in to say, If you fail to write consistently, the excitement for your, ide- your idea may begin to fade. When the work starts to feel like work, King describes the moment as the smooch of death. <laughs> His best advice is just to take it one word at a time. I'm going to just toss in there, I, and I might get myself fired when I, as I'm doing this, but in my yeah. bill pay job... I end up having to go long time periods of constant interruption with writing. What Stephen King said right there is a hundred percent correct. If you get pull, if you allow yourself to get pulled away, and trust me, if you're working for a living it, besides your writing, you're going to get pulled away. And if you've got kids, I don't have kids, but if you've got kids, you're going to be pulled away. But it's that time away from what you're writing, away from the excitement, away from the energy that you're creating when you write, you can't recapture it. Or it's very, very, very difficult to do so. Well, I was going to say, it's kind of like working out in the sense of, do you need to do it every day? No. I highly believe you need to take like a day off a week and not maybe Mm -hmm. write that day. I like Sundays off. Um, But I have to say, you have to consistently do it, or else your muscles are going to fade. You know, you're going to lose the plot, as he says. You know, different things are going to start to take over, It is something you have to, you know, consistently keep up. Uh, But then I always believe that it's kind of like riding a bike. If you set down the pen and you pick it back up, you know, a month, six months, a year later, you can probably still write. Mm -hmm. The question would be is, let's let's go with the long term there, a month, two months, whatever. Will you still have the same vision and energy of vision for the novel you were writing. Nah, you'd be telling a totally different story. That's right. And what does it matter exactly. if it's a good story? Exactly. Well, you're hoping it's a good story, but in my, at least what I've found... That's what editing's for. What you I've come learned back to, yeah, is that usually it's collapsed like a house of cards. So that's just me. Well, interest. And I do believe that once it becomes work, oh, yeah. that's the hardest part for a writer to get through. I mean, when editing becomes work, when writing becomes work, editing when any of it becomes... Work. Editing is always work. When you're in the middle work. of the story, and you're just like, ah. But he's right. You long. know, write one page. Write one paragraph. Write, write one 100 sentence. words a day. Yeah. Well, easy does, but it'll life. get done. Yeah. You want to be a writeaholic. Didn't we just Without talk about holisms? Yes. Without alcohol, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You okay. want to be a, you know, if you want to be a writer, you have to want to write. Yeah. It's kind of a thing. It's, it's a, Not just want to, do. Yes. You have yeah. to do it. Yes. It's almost a curse. Actually, it is a curse. <laughs> Pat Schneider or Julia Cameron who said, a writer is someone who writes. That's yeah. all. Mm-hmm. Okay, next one. 19. Finished your first draft in three months. <laughs> I cannot all right. do it. If you write every single day... 2,000 words a day, like Stephen King does, uh-huh. or 10, as he does many days. Well, okay. Well, King likes like to write 10 that. pages a day. Over a three-month span, that's around 180,000 words. The first draft of a book, even a long one, should take no more than three months, the length of a season, he says. If you spend too long on your piece, King believes the story begins to take on an odd foreign feel. Well, May thank I... you, Stephen King, for letting that be your day job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> May I point out that Stephen King also, as far as I know, is a pantser, not a plotter. He's a pantser, and he does everything in two drafts. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and... Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I think... That's his mode. Ours, I think, is different. Everyone's mm-hmm. is different. Well, oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't know. Go ahead. I think the, uh, the important takeaway for this one is to try and finish your stories in 
like as short a time period as you can because I know for me the more that I write the more I improve at writing so my writing voice changes and evolves and I also know that I plot kind of I'm a hybrid plotter pantser but after a certain point in a story in a long story a novel I know where it's going I also know that if I'm away from it too long I keep playing with it in my head and the plot points start to change and I'm like, ooh, but what if I did this instead? And the story mutates and it stops being the story I set out to write. It'll still feel exciting, but part of it has died because I took too long getting it all down. And so I think in that sense, it's good to write things as quickly as you can to get the entire idea and all the feeling that you had for the story down in one place, get it pinned down. Um, we can't all write a story in three months. We can't all write every day either, but as much as you can, try to get it all out in one go, however long that takes. Mm -hmm. And here's where everyone starts to hate me. Yeah, I, I actually do write in three months. I hate you, dude. Um, <laughs> I write, my books take about three plus months to write. Oh, now, here's the messed up thing. Mm. I am nowhere near 180,000 words. <laughs> I'm at more like 75, 80 or something like mm -hmm. that. Maybe, you know. Well, then we hit you just a little bit less. You know, and, and to be honest, some of those are middle grades, which means that they were like 60 or <laughs> maybe even 50 or so. So, um, yeah, Stephen, I don't know how the hell you're doing 10 pages a day. Well, yeah. That's amazing. That's but his day job. I do have to say the reason why I'm able to do that is because I really do try and write, even if it's just a paragraph, even if it's just a page, I really try and write five days a week. You know, I really try and sit down and do it. And do I always get to do it? No. Am I trying to do other things some days and maybe I'll only write a couple of sentences or a paragraph or half a chapter or something like that? But I, I, my goal is to write a chapter a day at least. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, and it can be a crap chapter. It's not like refined and pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. So if you write 750 words a day... Mm -hmm. For 90 days in a row, you'll have 67,500 words. And so that is almost a novel, depending on the genre you're writing. It is a novel, mm -hmm. again, depending on the genre. So there are ways that you can make that happen in three months, but it takes a lot of diligence. And as Brad says, you probably aren't going to be able to write all that you want to in a day. So... Yeah, you have to you have to give yourself allowance for that. Mm -hmm. yes. But creating a writing habit mm -hmm. will get a lot of writing done. And some writers will lock themselves away. It's, I'm looking over at Fedora. If, you, or if you're on the same telepathic mind I am right now. <laughs> well, I know that Eileen Dreyer does. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. We'll lock herself up in a hotel or something. Exactly. With no family, no anything, but getting the book done. Mm -hmm. I'm National that. Novel Writing Month. I am too. I was just about to drop that. Coming mm -hmm. up in November. We've got November coming up, which is the National Novel Writing Month. NaNoWriMo for those who are... Explain you know, a little bit, please. Not okay, so it. yes, for those who do not know what NaNoWriMo is, it is writing a novel in one month, or 50,000 words, from the beginning of November to the end of November. And please don't send it to an agent the 1st of December. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or even the 1st of January. Um, I was considering being a nano rebel. I think that's what that's called this month. Basically, I have a novel that I've been working on for over a year, and it's coming along slowly, but it's coming along, and I was thinking trying to get, with what I've already written, at least 50,000 words. Actually, I might even be there. I haven't added it up, but, you know, by the end of November. So, we'll see. I think what we were talking about with Nano and not sending things off immediately on December 1st ties in well with Rule 20. I agree. Next. All right. Number 20. When you're finished writing, take a long step back. King suggests six weeks of recuperation time after you're done writing so you can clear so you can have a clear mind to spot any glaring holes in the plot or character development. Yes. He asserts that a writer's original perception of a character could be just as faulty as the readers. Uh, King compares the writing and revision process to nature. When you write a book, you spend day after day scanning and identifying the trees, he writes. When you're done, you have to step back and look at the forest. When you do find your mistakes, he says, that you are forbidden to feel depressed about them or beat yourself or beat up on yourself. Screw ups happen to the best of us. Could not agree more. Two things. My succinct response to that is yes. My second response is 
in my bill pay job. I do a lot of writing that's legally business ease, government ease style writing. And you got a very short amount of time frame. And unfortunately, you don't get that time frame to walk away. And by the way, when I'm talking about what the, the amount of writing, we're talking a couple hundred pages as well. Like what, just like writing a novel. And you don't have that time frame. And I can guarantee you, there is no way in hell I can see my errors. I have to have someone else look at it because of that time frame. But I, six months later, or sometime later, I will mean, we'll come back. It's like, how the hell did I not see this error? Well, there are two things here. First of all, I think you ought to celebrate it. I'm, I'm the pizza girl. Have pizza when you nice. finish a novel. Have pizza with friends. It's great. Yeah. But then I will go ahead and do everything that I think I need to do promotion-wise for it to get it ready. Not that it's the final product, but I will do ancillary items right then. I will do a 100-word promo. I will do a 500-word promo. I will do a log line. I will do a elevator pitch, and I will write them all down. And try, because I think I will not be any better at doing it sometime later. And then six months later, come back, look, and see what you've got. And it might be totally awful, but at least you gave it a shot. And you have a starting place then for later. And I think you just gave me an idea, which I'll share after the, after the talk. Go ahead. Well, I, I would say that I completely agree that you have to take that step back. I, I highly recommend celebrating uh, every accomplishment that you uh, get as a writer. But uh, more importantly, I don't know if you need six weeks. Um, I do like two to three weeks at least away, sitting away from it, not paying attention to it. Um, oddly enough, though, I will never stop, so I'm usually plotting the next one or something like that. Or research. During those, yeah, mm-hmm. something. You know, so I, I usually fill that same writing time with something else, uh, just so that I don't get out of the habit of not sitting down every day to do something. Um, but I, I highly recommend taking those few weeks because it gives you that ability, as he says, to see the forest. And that, uh, when you're starting to edit, it is so important. And to be honest, when you've totally just come out of writing, mm-hmm. you're so wrapped up in it. You're in the characters' minds. You're in every scene. You're, you have such a, a macro vision, like I should say a micro vision of every little thing. I don't know if you can see at that point. I agree. Um, I'm going to jump ahead of you, just for a second, because it ties. I was going to say I was going to talk about this after. I was going to ask her about ancillary items, but but okay. Well, that case, I think we we tie together because that's where we go. Okay, go on. I said that Fedora, you gave me an idea. I was going to talk about after the thing, but after listening to Brad, I'm going to go ahead and say it forward. One of the things I was going to do with the novel I'm working on right now is start writing blogs and so forth. Here's what research, blah blah blah. But actually, I'm thinking what I need to do: finish the novel. Then during these six weeks to borrow Stephen King, every day write the blog, different blogs, and then post them on a weekly basis. So six weeks is 45 days, give or take, 45 to 50 calendar days. I'm looking at everybody. Six times seven? Six times seven. Okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) 42? 42. I said 45. That was close. 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 I was throwing a dart. Math is hard. (laughs) Nah, I just didn't have my, I didn't have my calculator going on in my head. Anyway, um, I just stuck my tongue out of Melanie. Um, but basically, 42 days, so that's 42 weeks of blogs. If one gets posted a day, that's about the novel that now I will be at the end of that, going back to edit. Oh, no. Now I'm good. Okay. I guess I stole her thunder. I'm sorry. No, uh, I had been going to ask some of the definitions of what Fedora had been talking about, but I think the moment's passed. I think we're good. <laughs> okay. okay. Look up log lines, ancillary items on your own time. We love you, everyone. Next rule. <sighs> okay. Rule 21. Have the guts to cut. It's oh, a tough one. <laughs> when revising, writers often have a difficult time letting go of words they spend so much time writing. But as King advises, kill your darlings, kill your darlings. Kill your darlings. <laughs> Even when it breaks your egocentric little scribbler's heart, kill your darlings. The stand. <laughs> okay. Although revision is one of the most important parts of writing, you need to leave out the boring parts in order to move the story along. In his, unvice- in his advice on writing, Vonnegut suggests 
Uh, if a sentence, no matter how excellent, does not illuminate your subject in some new and useful way, scratch it out. And I will say, we're going through a lot of Vonnegut's rules, and I kind of wanted to do Vonnegut's rules we at some future episode. We'll do that. So, we'll do it. You know, pay attention, we'll do Vonnegut someday, because they're awesome. Mm-hmm. I think no writing is ever wasted, and even if you don't use the writing that you're cutting out and what you're, you know, in the story you wrote it for, you might, you know, mine it later. So I, I keep an elephant graveyard of stuff that's been cut out. I think Jim does as well. Yeah, I have a graveyard file for all of the projects I work on. Mm-hmm. You just do a hard cut between every new idea, every paragraph that you, you remove gets on its own page inside the graveyard file. So if you need it, you can search keywords and just find it again. Save my butt a couple times. <laughs> uh, yes, this is exactly what I'm in right now. Uh, so I'm currently editing a book right now, and uh, killing your darlings is the hardest thing for me to do because I really like that sentence. I wrote that sentence that way for a reason, <laughs> and and now it's not that way anymore. <laughs> hmm. uh, but I have to admit, sometimes it is it is smart. If you're not moving the scene along and you have the dragon... Uh, you know, as kind of this major little thing, and he really just needs to be sitting on somebody's shoulder and popping around. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can move that wonderful description somewhere else, or just let it go. I have a lot of outtakes <laughs> that I haven't done this yet, but I really am planning to at some point in time, that I think might be the kernel of a short story that uh-huh. I might be able to put online as a promo for a longer piece. And Very so I, if I ever get that done, I'm going to tell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can read it. Uh, sometimes your darlings you kill are actual people. Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. I have... Uh, I, I was going through an old, earlier draft of my finished manuscript that's still unpublished, but we're trying our best. Um, but, uh, I had a burn, burning party, a bonfire party, in which I burned a first draft of that, and I had other friends bring first drafts of their work, too. And I told if anyone, told them if anyone was burning copies of mine, and they found a page with Sharon or Kindle on it, uh, they give an opa, because they no longer exist. They were characters that existed all the way up to, like, the much later draft, and I fought so hard to keep them in, because they, it was, it's like that... That heirloom thing that you've had forever. They've always been in here, but I can't figure out why anymore. Mm-hmm. And it was a matter of one day I, I pulled out a notebook and I said, okay, uh, plus or minus chart, the positives and negatives of keeping Sharon and Kendall in this book. And I was starting to, to make out the, you know, what are the positives of keeping them here and what are the positives of getting rid of them? And I realized real quick that the positives of getting rid of them outweighed the positives of keeping them because the only thing in the keeping them thing was they've been here the whole time. <laughs> and that's when they got kilt. I kilt those darlings. It was, uh, it was the best thing for the book, even though it was really hard for me to do. And in retrospect, it seems like, well, duh, of course I had to get rid of them. Obviously, all the jobs they were doing fit better into everybody else's job description. But it was, it was hard because you don't know when you're in the process. Yeah, I I have two characters in my book that I definitely need one of them, but I'm not sure which one or <laughs> both. Because you know the thing where I need the girls. Like I have my main character going to an all girls school, so it's like there are some lines that she needs to be talking to to somebody, mm-hmm. you know. And then but then you know her brother is you know he's he's there, he's convenient. He it, it, it explains why he's still around even after he gets beat up for being close to her, you know. Because <laughs> you know brothers have to stick around. I think you just talked yourself out of the <laughs> other, t- other character. Your darlings, Sounds your like darlings. your brother is more important as a <sighs> as a role. Perfect. I might need to ha- keep both of them. <laughs> okay, number 22. Speaking number 22, the last and final rule. Stay married, be healthy, and live a good life. King attributes his success to two things, his physical health and his marriage. As he says... The combination of a healthy body and a stable relationship with a self-reliant woman who takes zero shit from me or any or anyone else has made the con- continuity of my works of my working life possible. Uh, and then Shane comes in to say it's important to have a strong balance in your life, so writing doesn't consume all of it. In writer and painter Henry Miller's Eleven Commandments of Writing, he advises keep human. Some people go places, drink if you feel like it. See people. <laughs> Oh, I didn't see that. Huh. Yes, keep human, see people, go places, drink if you feel like it. Mm-hmm. I don't like people, I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Some people I don't, places. but anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and I think really on that note, um, 
there's nothing more really to add. So at this point, mm-hmm. join us next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing community. Have a great week writing. The new theme songs for Write Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Write Pack Radio would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their office. STL Books is a online bookstore specializing in new and used high-quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.